there's a huge difference between elite discourse on these questions and the discourse of everybody else. You know, like if you look at the controversies of the last couple of weeks where race is concerned, it involved things like whether Nicole Hannah Jones, one of the richest and most powerful and influential and privileged journalists in the United States, should get tenure at the University of North Carolina as opposed to like the eight other schools that have now offered her tenure or whether the tennis player Naomi Osaka, who made $55 million last year, should be obligated like every other player to talk to the press as a condition for participating in very lucrative tournaments. I think there's this like very strong disconnect between how race and gender and sexual orientation is talked about on the elite level and how everybody else experiences it. I mean, I grew up kind of like you in a very diverse neighborhood, a working class neighborhood raised by a single mother. And I had this experience, you know, I went, uh, my mother died in at the end of 2019. And before she did, I, I took my kids to, to, to see her and she wanted me to go into her work office, uh, her office. It was like a kind of blue collar office. Um, you know, it wasn't a factory. It was like, a they, she worked at a company that sold airline parts. And it was like, kind of like the home office of that company. And it was like blue collar, you know, and she was always telling me about the political arguments that they would have. And I, I walked in and it was like a very diverse office. Like the guy who was her friend who sat next to her, it was like a Jamaican immigrant who worships Trump. Hmm. And my mother hated Trump. And, you know, it was just like a very politically vibrant discussion. And I walked in and, you know, she wanted to kind of show me off. They had watched me from Fox and stuff and TV and Snowden. And I started participating in and listening to their discussion. And as somebody who is connected to the mores of elite discourse, they started like making jokes about each other's ethnicity and race and religion and age and like gender that were shocking to me. It was like, my reaction was like, you can't say that. That's (laughs) unacceptable. That's not allowed. And for them, the way they argued and spoke and like understood one another was so different in terms of its sensibility and ethos than the framework that elites who are African-American, gay, Latino, women try to impose on on everybody else. I think that Mm. there's a huge cleavage, a huge gap between elite discourse on the one hand and how everyone else experiences things on the other. Yeah, this is, um, I I really couldn't agree more with that last point. I, I don't think it's said often enough that the biggest difference on sort of the orientation, the proper orientation towards racism, the biggest difference might not be between black people and white people or even Democrats and Republicans, but sort of between elites and and everybody else. And that, that might seem shocking because if you are an elite, like, like I am and like any other human being in the world, you're only seeing, you're only noticing really what's in your own bubble. And then you, you look at the cleavages within the elite. Well, then you're going to see big differences between, um, you know, Democrat elites and Republican elites. And it's going to seem like that's the biggest division, but that's really a function of not being able to, uh, of being in a social bubble, which again is not anyone's fault, but, but it just, I mean, there, there's one example of this I thought was really shocking uh, and telling, which is last year when, um, when California put a Prop 16 on the ballot, which would have uh, um, overturned the ban on affirmative action that's been active for over 20 years there. So it would have reinstituted affirmative action in state institutions, colleges, uh, government jobs, and so forth. And on the side of affirmative action was all of these huge corporations, Facebook, Twitter, Uber, Lyft, Yelp, um, United, Wells Fargo, and so forth, uh, several major California sports teams. On the side of keeping racial preferences banned, there was no major corporations. There was just mom and pop shops and so forth. And when it was put to a vote, it, uh, racial preferences were uh, shot down by over 2 million votes, right? And and we're not talking about a, a, a vote where the white people in California had one opinion and the people of color had a different opinion. We're talking about a majority POC 
state to begin with, a state that's gone Democrat in every presidential election for the past three decades. So it's also not really a red versus blue thing. Um, and every majority Latino, Latino county in the state voted against affirmative action here. So to, to me, the, the biggest difference or the thing that stood out to me the most was the extent to which every single corporation was against the will of the public, which in this case was majority people of color, right? So what, what this tells me is that the sensibilities of the elite are that colorblind policy is, is wrong, um, whereas the sensibil- sensibilities of the public tend to be um, more warm towards colorblind policy and then also less, uh, less, less condemning of the kind of good faith racial jokes that people make amongst friends, as, as you point out. That's exactly the same experience I've had with friends that, are, that I have that are not part of the elite is that you can make jokes in good faith and there's an understanding that I don't hate you but there's that like the, it's it's really the antithesis of cancel culture um and again if you're if you're in a social bubble this is just something you're you're not going to recognize and i think part of the danger of what's happening now is a lot of people with you know sort of blue check mark twitter people with cultural power are too deeply ensconced in social bubbles to to realize the extent to which the sensibilities that that dominate in those elite social bubbles are not the sensibilities of the entire nation, regardless of race. And so you, you've got to be concerned about enforcing those sensibilities on the nation when they're really not widely subscribed. Yeah, you know, I think, I, I mean, I think there's the, an example that seems kind of trivial, but it's so vivid that it's worth focusing on, which is this attempt to force everybody to refer to Latinos, not as Latinos, the way most Latinos refer to themselves as, but as Latinx. I don't even know how you pronounce it, right? So you remove the O and insert the X to make it gender neutral. And, you know, in some circles, this is virtually obligatory. Like if you don't, if you don't use that word, it means you're, I don't know, harboring some kind of bigotry or transphobia or being, you know, you have a failure of inclusiveness, but you, they've, they've done polls, at least one where they've asked, you know, the broader population about this word. And like, no one's ever heard of it. And the few people who have hate it It is not a word they use. Yeah. So you have this like elite discourse taking place over here that has all of these rules and mores designed to coerce people and control them that are completely unknown to and foreign to pretty much everybody else outside of elite discourse. Right. And I think, you know, I think one of the ways to think about this is for me, the, the, the primary division in America is not race or gender or sexual orientation, but class. Mm. That to me shapes your experience far more than any of those other categories, which again is not to put yourself in the binary of saying that when I say that, it means that I don't think racism or sexism or homophobia or transphobia are non-existent or that they aren't factors in how people experience life. Of course they are. What I mean though, is that I think class is the bigger element. And the reason there's such a de-emphasis on class in elite discourse is obvious, which is that by virtue of the fact that people are part of elite culture, they've already kind of elevated themselves in a class way, but also there's not nearly as much class latitude in the United States as there once was, or there's certainly not very much. And especially in journalism, which is kind of like the controller or police of how discourse occurs on the national level, on the level of national media, there's such a disproportionate representation of people who come from rich families, rich neighborhoods, Ivy League private schools, 